Hey, well, welcome to our online services. Great to be with you today. My name is Fraser Venter. I'm the lead pastor of Cucamonga Christian Fellowship. But my goal today and every day of my life is to make Jesus more famous. And I think that's true as we watch online and we believe for God just to spread his gospel all over the world. So share this link. If you have a moment right now, just hit that little button and share the link and say, hey, come on and be a part of this party. It's amazing. And I really believe we want to see Jesus glorified with our friends and family. Wouldn't you agree? So let's share. Let's share that right now. We are in this great series called United, and we are in the series up and through our nation's election, which is right around the corner, and we are looking at the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 17, particularly, where Jesus prays one of, this, one of the most magnificent prayers that he's ever prayed, but yet not fully fulfilled, that we actually have the opportunity in this generation to fulfill a prayer of Jesus. I... That blows my mind. I, I, I think about how many prayers I have prayed to Jesus that I am believing for and believing for his response and he's been so faithful. Wow, what an opportunity that it gets to be reversed and I get to be an answer to the prayer of Jesus. This is what John 17 says. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, again, as we are one. Say one with me, one. I and them, and you and me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So if you're just joining us, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to this, the previous messages because it will really lay a foundation for what I'm about to share with you today. And of course, I want to ask that you would continue to dive into the prayer challenge. We have a few more days left until our election, and we want to make sure we're praying all the way up to our election, through the night, and especially, beloved, the next day. And my hope is to actually do a message the day right after election that will get out to you right away so that I can also encourage you because we recognize it's going to be a moment where some are going to win and some are going to lose, but let's make sure Jesus always wins because he always does. A couple of weeks ago, I made the following statement, and I actually want to correct myself. Say, what? Yes, I want to correct myself. I said that this United series is not a political series, but a Jesus series. Now, that is true, but I need to unpack that a little bit more. What I meant to say is that this is not a series to advocate one political party over the other, but to ultimately encourage us to come back to the one who should have our allegiance, Jesus, and be united to him. I think few topics can get our full attention than the topics of religion and politics, wouldn't you agree? Whether you're in your home or your workplace or your school or your sports bar or your church, those two topics can raise the adrenaline pretty quickly. And when you mix them together, religion and politics, it can create tension. I love this following picture because it just describes so many of our homes, so many of our workplaces, so many of our sports bars, so many of our churches. Please do not discuss religion or politics here, even in the church, beloved. Sometimes we're like, please don't bring those topics together, pastor. And isn't it amazing? I love the fact that I get to pastor in this moment. I, I want to show you another picture of what kind of describes what it means to be a pastor in this moment. Hey, be a pastor, they said. It'll be fun, they said. I'm not so sure over these last seven months I could describe what I've been experiencing as fun, but more like Jack Sparrow of running for his life. But in this moment, we will bravely enter into this topic of religion in politics. We don't have to look far or far around us to, to recognize we're in this, this tension, nation, state, county, communities, homes, the tension is rising. I love, Joanne and I have some passionate discussions around this whole area, but I recognize this, here's the truth, we still love one another at the end of the day because we want to see what God's going to do in our nation. And I believe that this is the moment for us to really stand up and be counted. 
So whether you're on one side, you can be assured there'll be someone on the other side. And that's why we've had this kind of united imagery of this teeter-totter, because that's so true. You can be assured that there will be opposite sides and equal vocal and confidence about their position. You're seeing it ramp up in the media. You're seeing it ramp up in deb debates. And here's the thing. And if you vote one way, you stand for this, right? And if you vote this way, you stand for that. And that tension is getting higher and higher and higher. But what do you do when you realize the tension is impacting your faith? And what do you do when you realize this is impacting your community of faith? And you recognize it's impacting unity of faith, so let's be honest and realize in most churches where people are sitting beside each other and proclaiming that they love one another, still across the aisle are many differences of opinions, vo voices, and voting preferences. And what do we do with that? How do we remain united? And I know some of you are thinking, well, they just got to get it right and get on the right side. And I, I, I just know on the other side that people are saying, if they would just listen, they would be on the other side. So what do you do to remain united when this question comes at you? When your religion at its core is political? Oh no, Fraser, did you just go there? Yes, I did. What do you do to remain united when at the core your faith in Jesus is at its core Political. Now, let me unpack that with you today as your mind is starting to spin and you're like contemplating jumping offline. Stay with me. Hang in there. The Bible says you got to love me. So love me to the end. Okay. It's a good country song. Turn with me to Matthew 22 and we're going to unpack that thought when religion and politics intersect. So if you have your Bibles, get there, Matthew 22, put one hand on it and put one hand on your heart and say this with me. Father God, open my heart to receive your word today and Holy Spirit, I mean really Holy Spirit, open my mind to receive your truth today and this is so important right now. Extend your hand to your neighbors. Jesus, bless my neighbor to live out your commands today. Amen. Let's make Jesus famous. Matthew 22. I'll pick up in verse 15. I think I'm going to read the whole passage because I think we need the context here. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. Entrap who? Jesus. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. And the Herodians were like political people that were mixed in both religion and politics. They weren't friends of a lot of people. But all of a sudden, everyone's an ally against Jesus. Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. They're asking Jesus, how are you going to vote, Jesus? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? The answer, the emperor's. Then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God. When they heard this, this is really important, underline, underline this in your Bible. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. Let me just say that again. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. And I think that the challenge for us in this moment in such a season is will we be amazed by the words of Jesus and stay with him? Or will we be amazed with the words of Jesus and walk away from him? At first glance, you may look at this passage and say, see, Fraser, I told you. Jesus is separating these two issues. We should not mix politics and our faith together. They don't have to be connected. Jesus said so. I think for some, our pol politics and our opinions become what I call convenient atheism, where we can leave God out of it and not believe he's a part of it. I don't think Jesus is saying that these are separate issues. I think when you unpack this, you will see in a moment that he's really connecting the issues. 
Is he just saying in Matthew 22, just give to the government what's the government and give to God what's God and therefore I don't have to really deal with the government because I really just have to deal with God. Or let me just leave God completely out of it and when I do government stuff, God, I'm not worried about your opinion. I don't think that's what Jesus is doing. I think Jesus is making a completely different point. Now, this question that is posed to Jesus by both religious and political people, isn't that fascinating? We often just run by that passage and just go, he's being confronted, he's being entrapped, they're trying to plot against him. And then we put it in a category of who's plotting against him, but there are the disciples, there are the Pharisees who are religious leaders of the time, and the Herodians who are basically political leaders. Interesting. So they ask him this question, and if if he were to answer that it is right to give tribute to Caesar, he would be discredited among the people of God as compromising the basic principles of what it means to be a prophet in the time. If, on the other hand, he were to disallow the paying of the tax to Caesar, that would then be used against him later, presenting that Jesus was against Roman authorities and was, would be called a dangerous revolutionary. So a few things come to mind when Jesus responds the way he responds. It's, it's so brilliant because why? Well, he's Jesus. Jesus in some ways is being asked, who are you going to vote for, Jesus? And his response is so, so powerful. For him, he can't take God out of the question. They didn't even ask about God. He's like, what do you want to do with this tax thing? And all of a sudden, for Jesus, every conversation has to turn back to the sovereignty of who God is. It's because in him, he can't take any side but God's side. Hear that, beloved? Wow. Jesus is not swayed by the opinion of my vote or will be persuaded to vote my way. Our involvement in civic life biblically is a responsibility that involves our faith because we see in the life of Jesus, hear me now, that he did not avoid it. It was always part of the discussion. Again, the people approaching him were both political and religious people. How ironic. The key for Jesus is, are you giving to God what rightfully belongs to him? And hear this, beloved, what rightfully belongs to Jesus is your whole life. Jesus points out so clearly in this illustration, I should have brought one that I got from Israel, the image of a coin. He looks at it and says, the image of a man is on the coin is not the biggest concern for Jesus. His biggest concern is the Imago Dei that is already imprinted on your heart. Who should be informing who you belong to and how you act and how you speak and how you pray? Now, remember, context is so key here. Jesus in chapter 21, right before this, is questioned about his authority. Where did you get your authority, Jesus? And Jesus knows, again, they're trying to trap him, trying to put Jesus in a box. So he asks them, as Jesus does, don't you hate it when parents turn the question around and say, what do you think? That's what Jesus do. That's where we learned it from. Jesus says, well, where do you think I got authority? And they're like, I, I, because they know they can't answer without clearly saying that authority you have comes from God. So Jesus isn't afraid to answer, so he does what he normally does. He tells a story. Matter of fact, he tells about three stories, and these stories are called parables. And these parables are in a, a, a section where we call the parables of the kingdom. So Jesus responds to where did you get authority in a story about the kingdom? because he goes on to describe what the kingdom of God is, who the king who rules it is, and the type of behavior of those who follow the king. That would be you and me. This is all the setup before you get to Matthew 22. Context is key. Matthew 22 then is a response to the offense the people, the religious leaders and the political leaders hear about this definition of the kingdom because the definition of the kingdom overwhelms them and overrides every definition they have of structure on earth. 
And then Jesus challenges them and says, if my kingdom is bigger than any kingdom on earth and you are my kingdom citizen, then you live above and beyond that, that everything you do is as a, a declaration and an ambassador as the king in this land. And they're offended by that because they don't know what to do with this now, this authority. Because what happens, beloved, when we want to pull God out of our politics, pull Jesus out of what he wants to do over the nation, we are trying to make him too earthly. This is the challenge that they're doing here in Jesus. Which way will you vote, for Caesar or for God? And Jesus is like, I'm always going to be on God's side, but you are missing the point. I am neither earthly or heavenly. I am both. I am the incarnation of the Father who walks the earth as a mandate of the kingdom to be demonstrated on the earth in flesh. Meaning, beloved, as you learn in communion, that Jesus through Philippians came so that he could show us what it means to walk the earth fully divine, fully man, and to say, this is how I walk it out. So when we are faced with issues like politics and elections, he doesn't to uh, separate the two, he brings them together and says, this is how the kingdom works in this moment. For Jesus, the entrapment is easy to unravel. No government exists without him. Why? Because he is the king who has come to establish his kingdom. You can try and separate church from state, but you cannot separate God from government. I'm not saying that all the governments are following the mandates of God, and I'll get there in a moment. But can I tell you this, beloved? The king of kings is not anxious about Tuesday. Not one bit. Because every government will have to bow its knee to Jesus. Because he is the king over all the kingdoms. Jesus didn't come to endorse a Caesar. He came to endorse the kingdom. And so should we. I love, again, what Tony Evans says. He says, God is not a Democrat. God is not a Republican. Shocking to some, I know. God did not come to say, take sides. And this is my favorite line. He came to take over. But let me pack this up for just a moment and walk this through with you so you might gain a perspective on how to be united in the midst of political difference and polarization. And so what do we do, Fraser, when we feel like the government is not really for us? What do we do, Fraser, when, you know, it just seems like we are on opposite sides? What do we do? We come back to understanding who the king is. This thing is so important when we, when we recognize that uh, we as a people are so blessed to live in this nation. I, I, I wore my American flag tie. I wore it today. Not because I have this un, I, I wanna be so patriotic and nationalistic. That's, that's not my point. I wore it today because I wanna be reminded to pray. I wanna be reminded to pray for this great nation. I wasn't born here, but I live here. My children live here. And my children's children may live here. And I, I believe that this is an important moment for me to pray for my nation. I'm not gonna give up on the nation. You wanna know why? Because God's not gonna give up on my nation. He's not gonna give up on any nation around the world, including Canada. He's not gonna give up, he's not. Why? Because I have to remember, I live under a theocracy while living in a democracy. And let me unpack that for you. Theocracy basically means it's the, the sovereignty of God. I live under God's order. See, we live under the theocracy of God because he's the king. God is king over all nations. But we have the privilege, we do in the United States, to live in a democracy. Let me point it out this way. Maybe you can think of it this way. In our nation, we have Bill of Rights that we try to abide by as citizens to promote the common good. But in the kingdom, beloved, he has all the rights and is unchanging because of his nature and purpose. So in many ways, we live with the Bill of Rights in our democracy, but I live under the kingdom rights of the king. And therefore, I must live in kingdom rightness so that I am informed by kingdom righteousness how to live in this democracy through the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights have no success in my life until I see it through the eyes of Jesus. And when I see it through the eyes of Jesus, it's then when I know they are being violated, our civic rights, that I must infuse the 
kingdom back into them. Here's the amazing thing God has entrusted, beloved, this blows my mind. He has entrusted that these kingdom rights, or another way to say it, his authority and dominion have been given into our hands. So I, I, I know I'm going through this long Bible lesson, but it's so important that you understand that in our relationship with Jesus, our religion and our politics are connected because he's the king of all kingdoms. And it's been from the very beginning in John 17, we've been talking about the fact that God gives us his glory. It's, it's a stewardship responsibility of his authority and dominion and rule primarily through the lens of love. He gives us this authority to live this out to the world as a model of what the government should be doing. When we don't live up to our level of responsibility and stewardship of the dominion and authority that God has given us, let me tell you, other systems of the world will want to take over. So God gives us this glory to demonstrate this to the world. And then if you wind the tape backwards, you realize in the very beginning, in Genesis, God created us in his image. Then he says, be fruitful and multiply, subdue, and have what? Dominion over all that moves on the earth. He, at the very beginning, says, in my mind, my hope is for the people of God to live at a level that is under my kingdom rightness. That actually the very need for government wouldn't be as necessary if people would live under kingdom rightness. But because God knows us, he recognized that we would falter and fail. He says, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help expand this so I can help you through this. Because in Psalms, he says, he made us a little lower than the heavenly beings, but he crowned us, beloved, with glory and honor. Again, to have dominion over the works of his hand. He has given us a responsibility as kingdom citizens to live under kingdom rightness so that we can bring rightness to the world. But in Genesis 3, it all falls apart, man. Three chapters and we're like, oh, no, we got to have a better system. And we've been doing that from the very beginning. At the very beginning, we rebelled. And that seed of rebellion has been trying to find its soil in every institution and system that has a relationship on earth. Why do we, are we challenged by different issues and systems? Because the seed of rebellion has been trying to filter itself in there without the mandate and rightness of God to be fulfilled. So what does God do? We fast forward, we get to Genesis 9, and God's like, we got to just do this thing as a do-over. But then he adds this statement. Not only do I want you to be fruitful and multiply, he adds this statement, which is so powerful for us to understand. He goes, and I want you to live by justice. I don't want you to shed innocent blood. The issue of life becomes an important issue for God. And we recognize that his kingdom now moves into a place of saying, if you want to create systems, then you're going to have to allow me into the system. Because systems without God will end up being corrupt systems. That's why the people of God must rise up and we cannot separate ourselves or turn a blind eye to it. Micah 6, 8, you fast forward, the prophet says this, he has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do what? Justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Some verses say, to walk justly, to love mercy. We gotta recognize that God is calling us into this place. That's why when Jesus came in Matthew 23, he basically quotes the same verse of Micah, but he turns it around. He speaks to the religious leaders. He speaks to you and I. He says, hey, you can do all the tithing thing. You can do all the, the things that I, you know, are behavioral based, but you have neglected the, the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. God is calling us back to be a people under the kingdom authority of God, stewarding his king of kingdom authority so that the world will see what justice and mercy and faith look like. Those things should be informing us every moment when we move into the election time that we're saying, God, how would you view this as justice and mercy and faith? Not just my opinion or what, beloved, I think is good for me. we got to fight against the systems that keep saying, I'm doing this because this is good for me. We have to submit and say, I must do what is good for the king. 
And that is a different thing. And it's proven by the cross when he says, listen, I'm coming into this thing and that doesn't feel very good, but I'm doing it because it has the greatest reward. So when Jesus shows up in the Gospels, immediately we read in the Gospels that he comes to inaugurate his kingdom. And he comes to say, this is what kingdom citizens look like. In Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Mark goes out of his way to share these very descriptive titles of who Jesus is, all to summarize that the king has arrived For Mark, the gospel clearly depicts that Jesus is inaugurating God's sovereign rule into the earth, the kingdom through his word and deeds. And he's saying, now it's your turn. You go on and read in uh, in Mark, uh, in the message version, I love this. He says, now it's your turn to turn your old life into a kingdom life. He goes on to say this, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Wow, the, the message version, I love this. Time's up. Kingdom is here. Change your life and believe the message. That's why when Jesus shows up, beloved, his kingdom shows up. And then he says, I'm going to live this out in front of you, what it means to be a kingdom citizen. And the disciples are always like, hey, it's our turn to take over. And he's like, you are so short-sighted. You think your takeover is based on an election year. My takeover is based on eternity. So God, help us to align to that. That's why Paul and the New Testament writers were so clear in Romans 13 and 1 Timothy that I just read with you and 1 Peter because he's saying, listen, Jesus didn't throw out government. Otherwise, we would never have heard that. We would have heard over and over, rebel, rebel, rebel against it. But we hear Paul say, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority, what? Except from God. So if God is the authority over all of our nation's leadership and authorities, we can't take God out of it. They exist only because God instituted them. Is that right? Instituted them. Have been instituted by God. Yeah, he instituted them. First Peter goes on, for the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether the emperor, the supreme, or governors. Man, you guys, when, when the, the, the apostles are writing this, They're recognizing that our responsibility was not to run and hide from it, but to move towards it. Government is a God-ordained institution to actually promote good and restrain evil. But we recognize sometimes it promotes evil and restrains good. That's where we as a governed people also have to be a governing people in the kingdom with our voice and our vote and our hands. Our allegiance always, beloved, is first to God and then to submit to the institution he established so that we can give influence. Much like I I shared earlier that this idea that we have a responsibility as committed believers to partner with God by expanding, hear me now, his rule through civil government. When government gets off and goes in the wrong direction, we are the moral anchor to pull it back. But if we don't recognize that it's under the influence of the king, we will force ourselves to have our own opinion about it and we will either go with it or we will avoid it. Therefore, when God acts in this moment, we, we have to align with him. And when government acts out beyond what is a desired intention, its purposes, right, for the common good, then it's we as a people who will be the voice of the heart of God and justice and mercy, love and righteousness. John Adams said this, the second president of the United States. Listen to this, this quote. Power always thinks it has a great soul and has vast views beyond the comprehension of the weak. And that is doing God's service when it is violating all of God's law. In other words, what John was trying to say to this, that when power enters into a system, it thinks it has a soul to do the greatest good, but when it takes uh, advantage of the weak and the voiceless, these services that they think are aligned with God are actually violating all the laws of God. 
So as kingdom citizens, we must cry out for the return of the king in this moment when those moments are being violated. And beloved, let's be honest, we're having lots of those moments right now. You pick an issue and we recognize we're having challenges in every one of them. So I'm not asking for the government to, to be the, breaking, uh, the breakthrough for me. I'm asking the God of breakthrough to break into me so that I can have a voice for breakthrough. That I would recognize that my job to love him and to love others and serve others and to align my values with the kingdom should inform my ballot and should inform my way of loving you even if we disagree. Therefore, when you're considering how to vote, you'll never hear from me which way to vote. That's not my responsibility nor something I could do in my own ordination vows. My, my goal for you, beloved, is to learn how to submit first to the allegiance of the king and his kingdom and then to evaluate his heart and not just on one issue, but all of them. Can I just say for a moment, beloved, there are more than just, it's more than just electing our president this year. There are multiple, multiple issues that we need to reconcile and understand, God, what are you saying in this moment? When we stand on just one issue, we may be missing many other issues. I'm not saying your issue is not a big issue, but I, I wanna tell you this, beloved, that God thinks about all of them, and we may differ on the priority of God's heart. But please know this, that his priority will always be justice, righteousness, mercy, and love. And it will always be about promoting his king kingdom and his agenda is bigger than mine. It's wider and it's deeper and it's longer than just, hear me now, hear me now, than just every four years on a ballot. I can think of no greater distribution of resource or status than to love God and to serve others with kingdom values and principles to bring back this into our nation. Here are some practical things. I know I went a little long, but I want to help you a little bit as you move into your election time. Number one, align your citizenship, please, above political ideology and partisanship. You have to align your citizenship to the kingdom. If you are a believer in Christ, your kingdom citizenship, your citizenship in the kingdom actually is over your civil and civic citizenship in a nation. That's one of the hardest ones for believers to get. And where we've gotten into a lot of trouble and when we have lost voice in the public square as a church is we have moved it this way. As if we were the very voice of God on every opinion where we've actually need to come back here and say, God, this is your voice and opinion and we're gonna to align to that. And sometimes it doesn't feel that comfortable. So we must align our citizenship in the right place. Our challenge is to rise above political ideology and lead on the moral grounds that God says, listen, if it doesn't go right or it doesn't go left, the call for God's people is to go deeper. The morality of our nation begins with the morality of the people of God who understand what righteousness and morality means in the King of Kings. The second is this, don't move on fear tactics. This is, I wish I had a whole message just on this one because this has been the strategy of politics from the very beginning. Every time you read something, see something on media, this person did this, this person's aligned with that, that person has this kind of conspiracy going on. You cannot be moved by fear tactics. Here's my one little phrase of that. Why over and over in the Bible says, do not be afraid. We are not a people of fear. Beloved, in the kingdom, kingdom citizens, I'm calling on you, stop being moved by fear. Fear is revealing actually something that you are afraid of that you are going to lose. But beloved, we are already dead in the kingdom and alive in Christ. I have nothing to lose. But if I'm holding on to it so tightly and if I want to vote that way so I can just hold on to it more tightly, to me it almost becomes idolatry. So we can't be moved by the fearful tactics that will be thrown at us from either side. Don't be moved by fear. You have nothing to fear. Jesus has got it. Second is this, or third is this. Words are powerful, beloved. Choose them wisely. And at the same time, don't be silent, but be seasoned with grace and truth. Be the advocate. You have to use your voice and use it through the vote, but you have to use it wisely. If it's going to tear someone else down or tear someone in the church down, that's not using your words wisely. 
There are moments, beloved, that we are called to speak with a great voice united together against that which would pull things down that are not of God. But the many things that we are trying to pull down in one another is about opinions, not God's opinion. So learn to be a holy advocate with your mouth and your message because everyone's watching. Here's one that is, whoo, not gonna be popular, but I think it's so appropriate to hear. Live beyond the vote. Oh. You have to decide, is one day bigger than your eternity? It's not. But here's the second thing. Let's not be lazy. If I vote this way, then live it the next day. If whatever your issue is, and you see I'm avoiding any issue because there's lots of them, whatever your issue is that you are voting on and you don't choose to live it out the next day, you are saying that government be responsible. When Jesus say, you be responsible. You be the voice for that issue. You live in that not just once every four years because let me just tell you, beloved, the day after, half the people are going to be disappointed. So, okay, if you are so passionate about the issue that you're voting on and thinking that the only way it will ever be resolved is in some meeting somewhere far away from your home, then let's get a clue that our nation will not be changed by what's happening just in legislation. It'll happen where we're living it out. I'm trying to smile through that so we can get through that. It's bigger than one day, so live your life like it's bigger than one day. Again, I want to come back, be a voice for the voiceless. I'll, I'll talk about this, uh, about some of the values we have as a Free Methodist Church somewhere. I'll record that for you. But I think your vote has to speak beyond you. There are things that are on God's heart like the poor and, and the dehumanized and systems that, that kill people's rights. God has a real problem with unjust things. And you need to figure that out in the multiple things that are shared on so many issues that are happening right now. God has thoughts on these things, beloved. It's not just one thing. But our call as in our vote is to be a voice for the, vo the, for the voiceless because they may not get to the ballot. The child in trafficking cannot get to the ballot. But you can John Wesley said this. This is really insightful. When asked by those in his church who had to vote in the upcoming election, this is in 1774, so you can put the dates together. He said this, to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy. So don't, don't let anyone buy your votes. Two, to speak no evil of the person they voted against. Wow, that's powerful. Third, and to take care their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. What a powerful word. In other words, vote from your own conscience, but don't speak evil about the other candidate, the other person that you disagree with. Such an important thing and an important opportunity for the church to lead in how to love your neighbors. See, the world won't know how to do this, how to love others when you disagree. They're going to be mad and angry. And... Yeah, beloved, rightfully so. There's a lot for us to be frustrated about. I'd rather have us have passion than apathy. I really would. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to love you in the midst of it, even if we disagree. Because why? Because I'm not waiting just for Tuesday to be the answer for everything or Wednesday. I'm waiting for my whole life for Jesus to work through it to be the answer to the things he's called us to. I'll wrap up this way. And many of you are like, whew. <laughs> Matthew 22, back to that, verse 22. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. I started at the beginning of the message, and I asked you this question. Will you be a person that when you hear the words of Jesus and how they align, and that really our Savior is the King of kings, the kingdom is here, inaugurated, and that authority has been given to you, will you stand amazed and walk with him? Or will you be amazed and offended and walk away? That's the moment that God has called us to 
in this season. More than anything, I am asking that as you move towards your ballot, that you would move one day ahead of it. God, give us the grace to understand what needs to happen the day after. And then, Lord, give us the courage to get in it the day after that. And, Lord, the day after that, and the day after that, that in this moment, if this could be one of the awakenings that we have for this generation, to not just put all of our hopes in a four-year cycle, but to actually start living as kingdom citizens that are actually living beyond, that eternity has entered our heart, and therefore the kingdom of heaven can enter this place, and that I can walk in the anointing and the power and dominion to make a difference in my life, my home, my community, and this nation. I believe we still have amazing influence if we can do it right by aligning our love to him. In this moment, let's be amazed that God didn't want to separate it out but that God wanted our whole life to be under his theocracy so that we could actually change a democracy. The worship team has prepared a song, and so for a few moments, I just want you just to pause and think about those things. I, I, I'm sure I, I said some exciting words for you today. And I guess as your pastor, I just want you to know I love you so very much, but I, I'm never going to shy away from the hard things because I, I pledged my allegiance to Jesus 30 some odd years ago, and I haven't changed my mind about who's my king. And I'm looking forward to what he wants to do. I don't believe it's all over. I believe I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, even in this nation. It may get harder. It may get really hard, but that doesn't change who he is or change my responsibility to be a part of it or to love you as your shepherd in the midst of it. Let's believe for what God can do. So take a few moments, begin to reflect on that, and let's see what God will do in this moment as we pray for the nation. And when we come back, I'm gonna close this up in a prayer from our prayer challenge and really believe for God to, to move this week. In Jesus' name, amen.
Yeah, let's believe that every nation will know that Christ is Lord. Amen. Well, I'd like to conclude our time using actually our United Prayer Challenge, the last prayer that you will find in the area called Praying for Your Horizons, which is about our government, our nation, and the globe. So maybe just get in a posture of prayer and just receive this as we believe for what God is about to do in this next week and then beyond and beyond and beyond. So dear Lord, today we declare that you will fill us with a spirit of power, love, and grace to pursue unity from our house to the White House. In this moment, we ask that you help us set aside our differences and seek the higher calling of making Jesus famous. Jesus, you have seen the rise and fall of nations, the coming and goings of those in positions of power, influence, and both sides of every story. Therefore, position me in the heavenlies so that we may gain your perspective on how to navigate the ever-increasing tension towards our government, nation, and globe. God, you have a great purpose for your people in such a time as this. So I choose to align with your purposes. I, I pray for wisdom and hope and truth to prevail over our land and those who are called to lead. Compassionate and gracious God, all tribes and tongues will one day have to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. So alongside this, we know the truth proclaimed in your word that we, each tribe and tongue, was created in your image. And too easily we have allowed division based on culture and language and political preference or race. Let me focus, God, today on our shared status as your creation and unite together over what we have in common and not fracture over what we differ on. We ask this, God, in your name, believing as Isaiah said, see, darkness covers the earth and a thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. May the God of peace, may the God of light, may the God of hope and justice and righteousness, may the King of kings be yours today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, CCF. Thank you so much for joining us online. I hope that you will share this message with your friends and family to encourage them. I look forward to connecting with you soon. And always know I love you and I am so grateful for you. Amen. Forever free.